Good afternoon, everyone. So it's lovely uh, to be here uh, to my uh, Funke Barua, and I'll be moderating this panel. So first, like I said to you all via email, this is not an academic panel. It's not a theoretical panel. Uh, it's just for us to have a conversation with the audience also uh, to, from our heart and share our experiences, our strategies, our learnings, and successes, and even our frustrations on working in the SGBV ecosystem uh, across the continent. We know that sexual and gender-based violence has become more prioritized at the global level in the past decade, with the recognition of the pressing need to create safer environments for women and girls around the world. In the last two years, however, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic brought with it a deeper focus on this shadow pandemic that has been and sadly continues to be the lived reality of many women and girls long before COVID hit. So this is a welcome development in a way, and we're of course building on years of activism and research, and now led by a new face of activists and uh, social disruptors, like I call them, young women. I'm also a young woman. So we know that social movements, particularly those that are led by young women, are critical actors uh, when it comes to preventing sexual and gender-based violence and the structural, and of course the structural drivers of violence against women and girls and how we can mitigate them. In this session, I'm going to be talking to this uh, lovely panelist about the efforts of young women across the continent to end sexual and gender-based violence from the perspective of your work or your activism, as the case uh, may be, uh, in terms of evidence and practice at regional and at national level, even at local levels, uh, uh, with a few questions. So, my first speaker is Miss Natasha Wang, whom I had the pleasure of having dinner with two days ago. This young woman is feisty. I love her. She's a 21-year-old passionate advocate. Natasha is passionate about using media to empower young people. She's a junior reporter child and women's rights activist at the Media Network on Child Rights and Development. She's also the Social Accountability Monitor at Southern Africa HIV and AIDS Dissemination Service. Please put your hands together for Natasha. 21. I wish I could talk to my 21-year-old self. You should be here. My second speaker is Sheo Aulua Sheo Ayodeji Oshobobi. Uh, Sheo uh, is, uh, leads the national advocacy to achieve SDGs 3, 5, and 16 in Nigeria. Uh, she's the executive director of Stand to End RIP. She, as a survivor of sexual violence herself, Sheo uh, founded RIP, a leading, uh, STAIR, a leading youth-led organization that adopts a comprehensive approach of working with communities to generate sustainable homegrown solutions and partners with local and national groups. In this last seven years, Sheon has fostered systemic change through educational programs and capacity building on SGBV. This young woman here, in 2019, and I've not even been a Time 100 Next honoree, she was a 2019 Time 100 Next honoree and awarded the 2020 Global Citizen Prize, Nigeria's hero. Recently, she won the 2020 U.S. International Visitors Leadership Program Impact Award. She's a founding member of the Feminist Coalition and council member of Feminist Collect Nala Feminist Collective. Put your hands together for sure. Thank you. And last but not the least, and the only gentleman on the platform, how does it feel? Reverse. Usually, it's usually just one of us on the platform. Uh, Dr. G Diallo, Jibril Diallo, has over 35 years experience in international relations. Uh, he serves at the African Renaissance and the Diaspora Network as president and chief executive officer. He's had a fledging career in the United Nations, from UNAIDS uh, to UNICEF to UNDP. The list goes on and on, and he began his career at the UN with the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees in 1980 in Geneva, long before Natasha. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, welcome, Dr. Jubil. Please put your hands together for him. Dr. Jubil, I'd like to start with you. You've had over 30 years of experience working in the UN. 
What has been your experience, really, and, and or your learning from the perspective of a global organization like the UN on uh, when it comes to activism around SGBB at the continental level? I want us to talk about Africa itself at the continental level. What has been your experience? What are the gaps? What are the resources? What are the challenges? What are we missing? I just want us to speak freely, you know, coming from that background. You've done this for the last uh, three and a half decades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, sitting here, I was recruited by the late Kofi Annan at age 27 uh, with a PhD in linguistics and communications from the University of London. So looking at the UN, the UN is a microcosm of society at large. So that what happens at society at large is what happens in the UN. And what I have seen is really there has been a growing leadership of Africans at the UN who are really making a difference. I'm very proud that the number two in the entire United Nations system, not just for Africa, 193 countries, is a proud daughter of Nigeria, Amina Mohammed. She is the boss under the Secretary General dealing with all aspects with the United Nations. Issues become important because important people are seeing to be paying attention to them. We have representing the African Union, 54 member states at the United Nations. We have also another proud daughter of Africa, of Nigeria, Amina Kiari Mohammed here present. So that that has been my experience that we need to push even harder to get Africans at the level of policies when it comes to JPO programs, when it comes to pushing women, we need to make sure that African women are also there when it comes to gender equality. This is my experience. The third and final point is that um, we need to push harder to make sure that Africa is represented in levels of position that you don't, we love to be in Africa bureaus in the United Nations. But I was the first director of communications of UNDP Global. So when I was wearing African clothes, people told me, but would UNDP represent you, recruit you, wearing African clothes for you to sell the brand of UNDP Global? So we need to make sure that Africans are not only inside Africa, but also in programs and policies outside Africa, because we have a perspective that is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jibril. I'll come to you, Natasha. Um, can you tell us, uh, you've done a lot of work. Uh, I call you a social disruptor. Um, what, what can you tell us about SGBV? How do young women engage? What are your, you know, the, the kind of strategies, what, you know, how are you disrupting the status quo on SGBV through young feminist activism? Okay, so I have been, uh, you know, I'm new to Nigeria. Did you say disrupting the what? This. Are you disrupting? Uh -huh. Disrupting the status quo oh, okay. with your activism. I see your post on what's it called? Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> no, there's another one, not Instagram. Facebook. TikTok. TikTok. The one you told me about. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I see your post on TikTok, and I don't have uh -huh. a TikTok app, but I've seen what, what you've done. Uh -huh. And you know, how are you disrupting <clears throat> the issues around SGBV? What kind of messaging are you putting out, and what mm -hmm. is that? What effect is that having on? Uh, our work, mm -hmm. maybe policy, maybe even what people are doing to implement change. Okay, so thank you so much for that amazing question. I, I love to greet people by introducing myself. So I'll say my name, then I would like to get to know all of you. Hi, everybody. My name is Natasha. What's your name? Lovely to meet you. So um, that's a very wonderful question. Before I even get to answer that question, I think we need to understand just how each and every one of us in this room has either been affected or you even know someone who's been affected by this, right? So, you know, if you want to close your eyes, you can, but I would like those who have either been directly affected or experienced sexual gender-based violence, or if you know someone that has just raised your hand. It might be a male, it might be a female. 
That's the majority of us in this room, right? And this is why we need to understand that these are things that actually happen to people. They're not stories that we come and tell on panels. They're not things that we just watch on TV about. They happen to your next door neighbor. They happen to your mom while you are in the same household with her. And this is why each and every one of us needs to take a stance because it affects each and every one of us. I was 12 years old when I started my journey on being an activist and an advocate against gender-based violence as a result of my work <coughs> pardon me for that as a result of my work with sexual and reproductive health and as a result I've seen so many amazing things happen I was recently awarded by the World Health Organization as the youngest recipient of their World Health Leaders Award because of that work I also work with World Vision for instance as one of their champions in Zambia on ending child marriages and one of the things that we've gotten to see is how this is quite multi-dimensional and sometimes we don't realize that each and every one of us have got a role to play the progress may seem small but it's actually making a lot of you know, we're making a lot of strides because I was recently reading how as it stands Africa is making progress there's still things that we have shortfalls for but we are making progress in ending this and so some of the work that I have seen happen is for one working in communities where these women and girls have actually been affected speaking to them and encouraging them I was telling a story of how uh, I was only about 13 years old when we went into a community of these amazing young girls but they were experiencing so much teenage pregnancy so much child marriages and it was really sad so we organized for an organization to go there and we said you know what let's invest in them let them understand what their rights are but beyond rights let them understand that they actually have dreams and they've got potential to fulfill and so when we went into this society we trained them for five years it took about three years for us to actually start seeing that their mindset was being changed and after five years these girls were now the ones that were sending messages to other people so imagine that I was 13 I turned 17 for me to see results of the work that I saw and these are some of the success stories that we have to see so you you need to get to a place where you realize that unless someone cares long and hard enough then there will be a girl that will constantly be abused because you have decided to keep your knowledge in this room and this is why even as we have these conversations I love them absolutely important but let's take them away from boardrooms let's take them away from conference halls go and sit down in your communities with people that don't understand that they can actually go out there get an education and make a life out of themselves instead of being beaten up by someone else and it's these simple things that we may not actually see so another thing that I do um, you did mention that I'm a social accountability monitor and what we basically do is I do a lot of budget tracking so you find that when they release the national budget for instance in our country I'll sit down with a group of you know people and colleagues and even with my organization we'll sit down and analyze the budget and we will find most of the time that only 0.01 percent of the health not even the national budget the health budget is going towards adolescent sexual and reproductive health and that's not just contraceptive and services that's everything you're talking about defense systems you're talking about about um, helplines, they're talking about services, you're talking about paying people to actually help these young people in these health facilities. And so with that, it's another success story that we saw. Not too much of a success, but at least it's something that we saw. So we kept going to parliament, we kept talking to them, telling them, look, this is what we want to do. We need these budgets adjust adjusted because it's clearly not working. And by the end of the day, one dedicated to adolescent health. Now, I'm, I'm personally not happy because what is 1%? The population is growing in Zambia, so what exactly is 1%? But at least it's something that we can see that it's making progress in some way. And the fact that we have actually even gotten international attention, the fact that we have organizations that are coming in and helping out in Zambia means a lot. So I believe in disrupting the status quo, what we can all do from what I have done is go to the communities where these people are and keep helping them. Go to the governments where these people are and hold them accountable because if you don't speak for them no one else is going to do so and then finally engage with each other network and find ways to make the change that you want to see back in your communities and these may seem like simple steps but these are the steps that have changed the world for so many young people in my country and beyond thank you
What did I tell you? <laughs> I could as well just go back to my seat now. Thank you, Natasha. I, I gleaned a lot from you. You've talked about uh, what we need to focus on. We need to stay the course. You're talking about um, sustainability of interventions and not just one-offs. You talked about a five-year plan to get young women out, you know, in a community uh, out of the, the cage of ch child marriage and teenage pregnancy. Uh, you also gave some gaps. You talked about the budget, the fact that the resources are not enough, very, very limited. Are there other challenges you have encountered in doing this work? One or two, just give, apart from resources, that, 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 that appears to be a general song, mm -hmm. even for Ford Foundation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think one of the other things that we have found to be a challenge with regards to sexual gender-based violence is we haven't had, at least now they are growing, but you know, when I started years ago, we did not have facilities that could actually help when, you know, for instance, if we take a child out of marriage, right, and we take her and we say, oh, we've taken her away from marriages, there's nowhere to take her after that because you can't take her back to the household where she's from, they'll sell her off again. And there are no facilities to take her for her to get healing, for her to get therapy or for her to get help. So it's like we are advocating and we want these girls to get out of marriages, but we don't know where to take them afterwards. And that was the problem. Another challenge away from the budget was that there were a lot of people that were hostile. And I'm not even talking about government. I'm talking about parents. I'm talking about community leaders and cultural leaders. Now that is changing, which I really appreciate because once we said having more conversations with them, they became more open to the idea of the fact that these are not cows or animals that you just sell off to make money. These are actually girls that will make even more money than the sons that you're trying to preserve. And I'm not trying to say, you know, men, women, whatever, but you know, girls are smarter anyway. So that's the whole thing. And yeah, so what we used to do is will actually go in those communities, will go to those traditional leaders, and will tell them, saying, you can't keep doing this. And, and the, cr the thing is, they actually have power because uh, we have customary law and traditional law in our country, and both of them are legal. So you can marry off someone if they are 16 or if their family consents to it because the traditional law allows for that to happen. But in customary law, it's not allowed. But if they come to you and say, we're using traditional law, then you've got no stance against them. So you could not take any legal action whenever sexual gender-based violence takes place. And then protection from families also. I remember, I remember, okay, I thought that was my phone. I remember how, um, I remember how we had a story of this girl who came to me and she opened up to me and she said, my brother tried to, was hitting me the other day. My brother was hitting me and she showed me the cuts on her body. And so she said she wanted to take him to the police station, but her mom, and the mom is like, has got PhDs, everything, she's good, the dad is good, but they told her if you take our son to the police station, you have to pack your bags and go. And so you find that there's that protection in families. And you might just think, oh, it's just a sibling rivalry, but it's not. Because that boy is going to grow up thinking, I'll always be protected because we are family. And if he can treat his sister like, let's not, let's not forget that your wife isn't your girlfriend anymore. She becomes your family. So if you hit your sister, then you will hit your wife. It's mandated. So that's, those are some of the challenges that we face. And then finally, even just persecuting these people. I remember we had this conversation with the council members, and it's something that we've actually seen, where there is no integration. I don't get why to date we have to go to the police station, report a case, but you still have to go to the healthcare center, pay for everything that they need as evidence, for you to take it back to the police station, and pay for more things at the police station, because it's just standard procedure. Standard procedure with your life. How does that make sense? So the fact that there are still laws and, poli and policies that do not regard human beings as human beings and that don't even look at status. And the fact that a human being that has been violated has to pay for the perpetrator who didn't have to pay anything to violate that person is absolutely wrong. So those are some of the things that we've seen as a problem and even just some policies that just don't work out. They don't match and it's really a whole conversation. We could keep on going and going but I see my other I have a lot to say, so <laughs> give them a chance. Thank you, Natasha. She, I'll come to you because she, she moved from that point where I wanted to look at the lessons around young women's uh, activism, what you've done, and you have been at the forefront of different movements in, in Nigeria. And how do, you bring, how do you bring or mainstream 
uh, that, that, that kind of experience from your NSAS days to your FEM, FEM Co to Nala FEM, how do you bring those experiences to um, ending SGBV? I know people like to use the word addressing, but you know, we, we have to think about ending SGBV. Shew. Thank you very much, and I'll make this very brief. Um, young women are definitely mobilizing across the continent, but I want to speak specifically to Nigeria. Um, when, and the um, former Emmy of Kano made reference to this, when um, Vera died while in 2021, we kind of were upset that there was nothing being done about it. So a couple of young feminists and also men created something called the State of Emergency GBV. And the idea was to look at the policies that we currently have in the country. How effective are they? So we have the VAP Act, which is, which is required to be adopted at the state level. And I know that about 32 states have adopted it, but it's not about adoption, it's about implementation. When the case happened, we saw a lot of dragging of feet by the Nigerian police. You know, there, till date, we haven't had justice, you know, a year down the line. And so young women are coming together to say, what experience do you have that you can bring to the table? I'm good with advocacy. You are good with policy implementation. You are good with communications. You're good with fundraising. How can we bring that together to you know, push the agenda for the elimination of GBV in Nigeria? Also, I realized that young people are mobilizing more on social media. Uh, because we've not really had spaces to speak, we now find alternative spaces, and social media has been that space for us. So typically, you can't hold maybe a politician accountable when you see him in person, but on social media, you can call your abusers out, you can call you know, um, a legislator out, you can demand change. So we are really utilizing new media for the work that we do. The third thing that I've, I've learned in my work is leaders of faith and culture have a very strong responsibility. Because our judicial system you know, is structured in a way that it limits people's access to, to services and to justice, people tend to look the other way and find you know, solace in the hands of um, the leaders of, of faith. And what happens is, because there is the culture of keeping things quiet and preserving names and preserving you know, religion, there is that innate feeling to tell someone, forgive him, right? But even Jesus Christ understands the law. Right? The Bible has, do not do this, do not do that. So I think that we just have a, a very, you know, core role to play in terms of holding perpetrators accountable, creating communal laws, or even implementing the national laws that we have. I had a story from um, a CSO who said they had a training and they had religious leaders in the room. And they said, if you support abortion, please raise your hand. And nobody raised their hand. So they gave a scenario, which ordinarily we should not need to dignify why women deserve services. But they had to give a scenario to say, if, you, if your daughter was raped, for instance, and she's pregnant, what will you do? Ah, God forbid, they said different things. And they said, would you be open to abortion? And they said, well, they are not going to keep the child of a rapist. So they will be open to it. When the story became personal, they were able to shift stance. But the, when the story is distant of other women, you know, they don't want to move you know, their feet. So I think that we need to hold them more accountable and um, engage them to really push the needle. And in terms of bringing the conversation to a, to a broader landscape, it's about young women mobilizing. Like you mentioned, I'm part of FEMCO, now I'm part of NALO FEM. I am giving my expertise to the continent. I am working with these amazing young women to hold government accountable to their Jeff commitment. Nigeria pledged half a million to ending child marriage. Where is the money? What has been done so far? How many youth-led organizations are being funded to be sustainable? Natasha referenced doing advocacy for five years. How many donors will give young people money to do work for five years and expect us to make impact in two days? Advocacy takes time. It takes effort and commitment. And I, th I think it's important, you know, that funders, government institutions as well, because I work a lot with the Ministry of Women Affairs. And what I've noticed, and this I'll, I'll wrap up real quick because I know we're out of time. What I have noticed is there still seems to be a gap in our interagency coordination, right? NSCDC has a policy that gives them the mandate to prosecute rape. So does the Nigerian police. So does um, NAPTIB. You know, there's so many bodies that have this power. The Ministry of Women Affairs has a situation room. NAPTIB has a sex offenders register. But those data don't correlate. So we don't have a proper coordination 
amongst our agencies, and that is causing a collapse in terms of service, service provision. Ministry of Health, Justice, Women Affairs, Education need to form like an interagency coordination, I don't know, committee, where if a survivor requires medical services, she doesn't need to go up to point A, point B, point C, point D. They can go to one place and easily access all of the services because it's holistic. And that's what states like Lagos State has achieved. Cross River is trying to achieve that right now. Still is Ogun State and, and or your state. But we don't have that interagency coordination to make it easy for us to really provide services to survivors. I have a lot more to say, but I would, I'll just... Thank you, Shale. <laughs> I hear you correctly. You talked a lot about the role of uh, faith and cultural leaders. You talked about uh, um, donors putting their money where their mouth is, and even government's commitments and resources long term, just like Natasha uh, mentioned. I wanted to ask one more question before I go back to Dr. Jibber about um, the, at, at, the, at the Africa level, is there any what, I know NalaFest is doing a lot, and you are mobilizing this movement of young people. How are you connecting uh, to other young women across the continent? What's the plan, you know, to get a movement going, you, you, to really leave out some of the things you are talking about in terms of long-term uh, sustaining uh, these kind of conversations and sustaining the work that you're doing? Thank you very much. So NalaFest is one today, and we've taken the past one year to strategize. Um, how to make the space more open to other young women across the continent. And so what we're doing is we're going to have a membership where young people can learn from us. We recently, well actually this morning, we launched a book called I Am Nala, and it documents the stories and journeys of seven women across the African continent. What have we done? Where have we failed? What are the challenges of experience and the triumph? What can you learn from us? Because unfortunately, we didn't have those documentation. If you notice, and it was mentioned earlier, women were part of the fight for independence, you know, and liberation. But when it came to representation in power, women were missing, their stories were erased. What we are trying to do is ensure that our stories are not erased, and the younger generation can connect with us. Um, Natasha is the youngest on, on, on our council. Natasha is going to mobilize Zambians in our country. I am Nigerian. I am going to mobilize young feminists in Nigeria. So Nala Femme is that platform for young people across the continent to really, you know, connect, but importantly, to do impactful work. We have something called the Nala Academy, which would launch towards the end of the year, where we would have young people across the continent learn from our own expertise, and then we can begin to divide. So we have 10 demands. There's demand one, I champion two. I would work with a set of people to champion two and hold governments accountable. Natasha will work on the other, you know, um, um, demands. My, my colleagues will do that as well. So for us, we're trying to not just keep the knowledge to ourselves, but create a platform where we can co-learn, right? Not, you know, not about teaching, but we're co-learning. But importantly, we are helping each other hold our government accountable and getting women into power, because that's the end goal. Thank you, Shil. I know that we've had a history of organizing and the feminist movement, and of course we've documented a lot of this. What I think is different is the way uh, young feminists, Z, Z, Y, I don't know which generation you guys are, you know, is different, and there's a lot of tech, uh, you know, uh, around this. Uh, Dr. Juba, I have one more question, and I want at least one or two people from the audience to ask something. Um, Shale and uh, Natasha talked about uh, um, development partners and their role and funding. Uh, in your experience, what, what, what can you tell us? What's the next frontier? What should we be doing more uh, to support young women activism uh, to end SGBV? Or what should international organizations like the UN, coming from U the UN and others, be doing? First of all, I think I'll take a step back uh, to make sure that we understand that this issue is a global issue. The United Nations has determined that no country in the world treats its women as well as it does its men. 193 countries. So we've got to end the apartheid of gender as forcefully as we ended at Af apartheid in South Africa. Second point is that uh, I represent the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network. You have 170 million people from the diaspora who are descendants of daughters and sons of this continent. So the African Union has decided that the diaspora is the sixth region. So that connection 
is some of our work which we're doing from the headquarters of the organization, which is based in New York. The third element is that uh, there are two universal languages. One is culture, the other one is sport. So since 2019, the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network has been using the convening powers of sport to give a red card to all forms of discrimination and violence against women and girls. Because as you know, when you get given a red card in football, what happens? You're out. So we want to make sure that we use that convening power in order to get off the field any individual, any organization that is giving violence against women and girls. And we need one million signatures. You can go online and sign your pledge to this connection. Final point is that we are reinforcing the partnership with men. The African Renaissance and Diaspora Network in partnership with UNDP, in partnership with UNFPA, UN Women, FIFA, among other organizations, launched the Red Card Campaign two days ago in Dakar, Senegal, and we appointed the special assistant of the president of DRC as Goodwill Ambassador for Positive Masculinity. We've got to have men as allies in terms of change of behavior, because what happens is that when you go home, the child, 10-year-old, and the daughter, 9-year-old, the boy comes and throws the bag and goes to play football, and then the daughter is brought, you have to go and help your mother. So we've got to go down at that level so that the idea is that we need to make sure that uh, we go beyond the United Nations. We do two things. One, we unify the efforts which are happening. A lot of efforts are happening in gender-based violence, but the efforts are too disparate. It's just too many. Everybody wants to have their own logo in the activity more than having uh, the support to the activity itself. So we need to deal with that. Secondly, we need to deal with the convening powers of sports and culture. When Nigeria was here in 2014, Nigeria was qualified for the World Cup. It didn't matter what political party you belong to. It didn't matter what ethnic group you belong to. Everybody was behind Nigeria. So we need to make sure that violation of human rights of women, 74 years after the adoption of human rights, is a violation of my human rights. Therefore, I am Nala myself. Thank you. Thank you. That's such a Thank you very much. I know Natasha wants to say something, but I just want to take one question from the audience. One? Anyone? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, in line with what um, Ms. Natasha said, with all what we say here, but what I want to understand is what should be done. I took the road from my country, three days on the road to get here, but I get to the bus stop and they tell me I can't sit on the front seat because I'm a woman. I should go to the back. At my organization, I cannot campaign to become a delegate because I'm a woman. Only men can lead. Only a man can head the organization because he is a man. I cannot. When I go back with this information and I decide to postulate and they turn it down, what do I do? What is the way forward? I have the information. I go back and I assemble women in my community and I dish out the information to them. But what next? Thank you. Sean, do you want to respond to that? Because I think some of the comments have actually like marshaled out action points, what should we do? There was a second question, person. Um, one minute to Boshio. I wanted to take a guy, but okay. One minute, Shio. 30 seconds. Do you want to respond to that before you forget? 30 seconds. 30 seconds? Yes. Okay. So for me, I think it's about disrupting the patriarchy and social norms that limit women's access to spaces, right? You being, not being able to sit in front of the boss. It's not just about, as, it's a violation of your rights, I get it, but it's also speaking up, right? Why can't I sit there? Sit there, sit there, take that seat, right? If they Why say you can't, boss? I mean, just sit. I've had it happen to me before. I can't, I sit there, carry me out. You will see trouble. Do you understand? Sometimes you need to speak up because we have that culture of respectability and silence, right? And they thrive on that. So when somebody challenges your human rights and your personal safety, you challenge them back. 
And Thank that's all you, I can Shil. say. I think you should also refer to the charter of actions or demands that Nala has. I think those are very key action points. So, okay. yes. Thank you. Well, yeah, my question, 30 seconds. Yeah, my question would be, what's the strategy to get in all this, this conversation on the campus structure in Nigeria? What's the word? What's the strategy to get in this to campus? On campus? Yes. Please. SGBV. Plenty. Are you from Nigeria? Yes, I am. We have an organization called Gender Mobile. Okay. Well, that I'm bragging now for the sponsoring. As doing a lot of work on campus, and there's a campus file app. There's a welcome to campus uh, 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 info kit. There's standard, uh, stand to end rape. There's tech hat. There's so many organizations doing a lot across. I mean, Gender Mobile, for instance, has reached about 110 universities in Nigeria. But I'll let Natasha say something. Maybe as a young person on campus, she has something different. Okay, thank you so much. Um, concerning that particular issue, actually, I believe it's it's about mobilizing. Like she said, there are so many avenues that you can take advantage of to bring these conversations into the room. And the thing is, even on campus for us, before I have an organization that we run at home as well. And so when we said, when I say during my university days, we actually thought these young people or these students know these things. Because, you know, one, they come from, you know, of families that are considered well to do and then secondly they all have phones so they obviously have information but that is not true there are so many people that are actually ignorant of what these things mean and what they think what these things actually are and just because someone may look rich doesn't mean that they're not going through any form of violence and that also brings me to the point that I wanted to make we should in as much as we are emphasizing that a lot of women that need help with regards gender-based violence whether it be sexual or any sort are in rural areas there are many people in urban areas that are suffering just as well and we should not ignore them or we should not make it seem like they do not need help so we should reach out to them in ways that we can and then the second thing is that we also need to work around investing in emotional intelligence away from the sexual I think that's also happening because you mentioned TikTok if you go on TikTok right now and maybe go to your for you page or whatever you'll find so many videos of girls posting about toxic relationships guys posting about toxic relationships and we try to complain and don't understand why this generation has a lot of mental health issues it's because of these toxic relationships and these are the toxic relationships where this violence takes place because it's the breed ground so we need to invest in the emotional intelligence of young ladies and even the gentlemen so that we can actually breed relationships right. that to be helpful thank you so to thank society you. <laughs> thank you, thank so you Natasha thank unfortunately you so we are at the end I'm so sorry you can see the the moderator is already here but just to answer uh, the person who asked for strategies, there are clubs in many schools, in many uh, um, secondary schools right now, even universities, anti-SGBV clubs. There are apps, you know, for reporting, there are apps for, uh, for mentoring, there are apps for advocacy going on. There are lots of social media uh, 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 programs that are also ongoing. But I know about the clubs that are going, I know about the advocacy, I know about the mentoring for young people to even understand and be aware and to call out uh, uh, violence because there are a lot of forms that people don't even know. Some people don't even know they're being uh, abused. So I want to thank my panelists. We're out of time. I really apologize.